Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel Wrightside Blonde. This week I attended the 29th anniversary of the original George Magazine launch with Rosemarie Terenzio, who was JFK Jr.'s executive assistant at George Magazine back in the 1990s, Liz McNeil, who is an editor-at-large at People Magazine, and Paul Begala, who worked with the Clintons. It was an incredible event. I got to meet both Rosemarie and Liz and discuss George Magazine and just hear their thoughts about George Magazine, which I'm going to share with you all here in just a little bit. But a lot of people said, wow, you went to the DNC, you went to Chicago, where all the Democrats are? And I said, yes, I did. Number one, because JFK Jr. was a Democrat, as we all know, and he spoke at the DNC in 1988, as we all know. But more importantly, if there's one place I know that I'm safe having an alternate opinion from those who are in that area, it would be at this George launch party. After all, the entire premise of George was to bring the right and left into one magazine and let people make up their own minds about their own politics, to make it enticing and fun and engaging so that young people, whether on the right or on the left, would take part in their governmental process. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to these stories. I've heard some of them before, but some of them were new, and I just found myself laughing, and I think you guys will like the stories as well. But I really love the concept of George Magazine. A couple people asked me, why would you go to this event? Why would you come over here just for this event? Well, it's because I really truly believe in that concept. I believe that we need news that doesn't focus on one side or the other, especially the young voters, the 18 to 24 year olds who are still forming their opinions about certain topics, as well as the older generation who maybe saw things one way, but are now starting to see things a different way based on maybe things they found out recently. The bottom line is you're not gonna find that on one news source. If you're like me and you watch all news sources so you can hear all different opinions and also know what the left is thinking as well as what the right is thinking and then you can form your own opinions, that's different. But I would say the majority of Americans are living in echo chambers of their own thoughts and beliefs that they already have. I think JFK Jr. was ahead of his time with this concept and I think now more than ever we need a concept similar. I'm not sure how we're gonna get there but I know a lot of Americans want to see unity again in the near future. And just for the record, I did talk to several Democrats in that room, and we had some nice conversations, even though we disagreed on some issues. It was very civil, and that's the way I like to think of American. We can have some civil conversations without screaming at each other. I think it is possible. But enough of that. Let's get into the conversation with Rosemarie and Liz. Rose, take us back to the nice convention, John hosting everybody at the, uh, the Art Institute, right? We took over the Chicago Art Institute uh, in 96 at the convention here, and John flew the entire staff, 45 people, down to Chicago so that every single staff member, including the interns, could be at the party. It was over 2,000 people, and we were just at the point that Oprah Winfrey, Hillary Clinton, and Chris Rock, and Maria Shriver walked in at the same time, and right behind them is the fire department, and they're, we have to shut this down, it's a fire hazard. I'm like, okay, one second, one second. I'm like, where's John? I grab him across the room, I hand him, I push him in the photo, we take the photo, I'm like, okay, we're done. I, was, I got the photo though. So it was, it was the bash of the 96 convention, and I was getting phone calls from people. I own a hair salon, I'll cut your hair and the whole staff's hair for free if I could get one ticket to the party. If I could, everybody was trying to get into this party, and it was a huge bash. And at one point, before it, I said to John, I think it's out of control, there's too many people, it's 2,000 people, and he's like, it's great. Big same town. Let it rip. I was like, okay, let it rip. It was phenomenal. We had the best time, and we were we were the game in town that night, and that was his goal. The essential focus of George was to celebrate politics and to celebrate politicians and to merge politics and pop culture. Right? That party did that. The magazine did that. People did that. Liz, uh, giving him the nickname that he bore with with good grace for the rest of his life, sexiest man alive. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of our favorite comments was from one of John's closest friends, Robbie Littell, who said, because we were like, how did John really feel about being sexiest man alive? 
And Robbie said, you know, the only thing that upset him is that there was going to be a guy after me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but there's a whole funny account in the book about how John was chosen. It's completely unscientific. I think the editor said, uh, I mean, basically they saw a photo of John playing football in Central Park, and they're like, that's the guy. And uh, John only found out about it when it was on the newsstand. But, you know, I don't think he was too upset. Yeah. Well, Bobby was upset. <laughs> Bobby was. Yeah. There's, a, there's a funny story about that. So John is sexiest man alive, and Bobby is on the cover of New York Magazine while we're at George. And sexiest man alive was years before George, but we're... <coughs> at the office and we have all the magazines on the desk and there's Bobby's on the cover and it says the Kennedy who matters because Bobby was cleaning up the Hudson River and John picks up the magazine and he goes to who? <laughs> and he throws it down and his assist Bobby's assistant told me this story when Bobby picked up the sexiest man alive cover and he goes can you believe this? and she goes yes I can <laughs> That's great. 88 was the first time John Kennedy Jr. spoke at a Democratic convention. And you report that out in, in the book. Uh, I was there. It was riveting. It was overwhelming. Tell me that. Um, I think that's the first time that the country really sees John as a grown up uh, young man. Um, and he introduces his uh, uncle, uh, Senator Kennedy. And I think the remarks are very brief. And I think we spoke to somebody who coached him, and John didn't have that much media experience. And you can see that John, he's kind of learning how to read from a teleprompter. So if you ever go back and look at the, it's a very, probably three minute long speech, and John's looking here. And he's very good. But, um, but that's the moment, right, where he sort of like uh, comes onto the national um, stage and, you know, like, Basically, that was the same year, 1988, that he became Sexiest Man Alive. And it's really, you know... It was a big year for John. You know, and when you see the, um, sort of the, the emotion that he could elicit in a crowd, which is a lot of what our book is about, sort of this, Rose always talks about this emotional connection that people have to John. And that's one of the first moments that you sort of see that, I know, after the scene. Well, Rose, you, in the opening of the book, it's one of the most trenchant observations you talk about John, basically he was born on the front page, died on cable news. Every moment in between, he was famous. And he was in pop culture involuntarily. And you say this, right, actors can quit acting and singers can quit singing. But he couldn't quit being John F. Kennedy Jr. No, oh, it was his birthright. I mean, he had no choice. You couldn't go and hide away and say, I'm not going to act, or I'm not going to sing, or I'm not going to be in politics anymore. I'm J. Pitt Jr., and the whole world knows who I am. But I think that when you talk about the emotional connection to this country that he had, I mean, from his birth, and he talked about it, you know, how do you, when folks would say, how do you handle the fame? How do you handle the fact that people everywhere know who you are? And he said, I've never known it any other way. So it's really not strange to me because it's my life and that's, that's what I know. But I think also he had a determination. And especially living in New York City, there was something about John that was like, it's my city too, I live here, I belong here. I'm not going to let anything stop me from living my life. And he had a surprisingly normal life, which was extraordinarily amazing to me that he, there was no one, there was no agent, no manager, no security, no PR, I mean, there was me, and that was it. Well, he, in fact, you have Mike Tyson interviewed in the book, oh, yeah. who talks about how he was shocked running into John, and John didn't have security. And he's like, I'm Mike Tyson, and I have security. <laughs> he, he, but he carried it so lightly, so casually. He came to visit that in Maine, Austin, and I booked him into the Four Seasons there, nice hotel, a Zoom name, because I didn't want people to know. I didn't tell anybody he was coming. And he came by my office, and we were working on the magazine. And back then, the cutting edge was fax. So he wanted to fax something back to New York. So where's the fax machine? I said, it's you know, down the hall to the left of the file room. Well, it was a farm that had, you know, you had to punch in a code, so we knew which client to rip off on the, on the <laughs> I 
I didn't tell him that. So what do I know? So I got down there to him. He's in there and he's trying to fax it back and he can't get it to work. And Angela from down the hall walks in in Austin, Texas on like a Thursday afternoon and there's John Fitzgerald freaking Kennedy Jr. in her file room saying, excuse me, do you know how to work this thing? And I swear to you, she hyperventilated. She, she, and John, like, he comes back to my office and he's like, hey, I think somebody needs to help your friend. And I said, you know, shit, I've been to your office a hundred times, nobody ever hyperventilated. How do you deal with this? And he said the same thing, Rosie, it's the only life I've ever known. Um, but there's a lot of people who do know that life and it burns them up. How do you protect against that? Um, I mean, good question. He had like a certain ease. And I remember it was probably a couple years after John had died because I sometimes would, I would be a little bit embarrassed at people because I'd always be calling about John or trying to get people to talk. And John, you know, John's friends didn't talk. So I think I have one one source, like sort of the designated friend who could speak. And then after uh, John died, his best friend was Robbie Littell again. I must, maybe I was apologizing. I said, how did John really feel about it? He said, you know, John would have missed uh, the, the reporters and the photographers if they weren't there because you've been there since the day he was born. And when he said that, I was shocked. I was like, oh, really? Like he didn't hate us? Or he was, like, we had been there the whole time. But I think John did sort of have a, he was able to, one thing I've learned, sort of like live his own life and have a certain kind of independence because there were many friends who never spoke. I also think part of that was that all of his friends were not famous people. They were not, he didn't run in that circle of famous celebrity. It was all like when, when we were talking to our editor at Simon & Schuster, and she said, well, who are your sources? Who do you have? And I said, Robbie Littell, <laughs> Kevin <laughs> Ross. And she's like, who are those people? I'm like, these are people who've never spoken before. So he surrounded himself with real people and real friends. Um, but I think one of the things I think about getting back to George was the sort of nonpartisan, not just politics as usual. But I also think when you look at George, it sort of was him. He was the intersection of politics and pop culture. And Paul, when you were writing for George, there was there was you, and then there was the Republican person writing for George, and there was always that balance in the magazine. And I think it's really it was the iteration, the first iteration of the Huffington Post, the Daily Beast, even Politico, Axios. How? What did you think as a political strategist? Um, about the concept when he came to you and said, I loved it because it's celebrated. I think politics is good. I think politicians are good. I think anybody in either party who sticks their neck out, right, to take the shit you have to take in that life is worthy of my admiration. All. And so I loved that John wanted to celebrate that. And he knew everything the good, the bad, the ugly. He said, What do you say? Like, I've had the front row seat for the circus all my life. Yeah. And he wasn't jaded, he wasn't cynical, he celebrated it. And then, so that radiated out, and he celebrated people in pop culture who did. Instead of, before George, it was a priesthood. And it was, the high-end magazines, they were great, they were all run by smart people, they all went to the same schools, and it was fine, but it was boring, and it was insular, and it was elitist. And John was none of those three, man, and he wanted to blow it up. And so, and so he did. And so, yeah, we had coverage with Cindy Crawford. And he, my mom was so upset when <laughs> Drew Barrymore did the Marilyn Monroe cover. Oh my God, my mom would get pictures of John's father in her own. But he, he wanted to like blow up the old genre. He also had a great comment to a reporter who said, are you embarrassed for making, you know, for putting somebody on the cover as Marilyn Monroe after all of the you know association with your father and this, and he said you know it's funny you guys get to play with the iconography of my family and it's father for all of you but when i do it it's no good <laughs> and then he also say if it doesn't bother me why should it bother if it doesn't me? bother me why does it bother you <laughs> well that press conference when he rolled out the night uh reasonably well attended and you <laughs> yeah and never seen anything like it and you wrote that speech. I, I helped him, he wrote it. But he he was, um, the only thing he was nervous about was Maurice. 
Oh, really? Where is he? Where is he? Oh, where is he? Oh, wow. His mother's partner at the time. Wow. He was really sweet. Yeah. And he got the weight of the world and millions of dollars, and it's all him. Nobody's going to say Michael Berman. 350 journalists right. in the same room. Oh. And that was the only thing that he wasn't flustered. Dude, that he was like anxious. Do you want to make sure Maurice was like cared for and not left out? Um, and he got every question in the world. And and you know, we're going to be talking about it in the book, but the prep session was much rougher than the reality. Okay, so it yeah. should be. We went to his house. Gary Ginsburg was a dear, dear friend of his and a dear friend of mine. That's how John and I met Gary set up. And it was just, I think, us three. John's wife and I think Michael Sheehan is a speech coach. I think. Michael might not have been there. But we're just going through questions, and you do want to be as rough as you can in the prep so that the person is ready. Gary was this close to John that he said, it. Are you going to be doing uh, investigative pieces? John says, It's more like celebration and lifestyle, but I can't rule anything out. Gins, why? Are you going to look into who killed your father? Oh my God. You know what's that? <laughs> he, I, I was like, and John said, no, I thought about this a lot, and I could spend the rest of my life chasing that story, and I never get an answer, and it wouldn't change the most important fact, I don't have a dad. And that, yeah, that was, that was, whoa. And he did carry, I mean, publicly he would carry it lightly, but you know he was still a fatherless child. Yes, and if you, if you, when you go through the book, what you see yeah. Yeah. throughout the book is, him constantly searching for this emotional connection to his father. Gary also said to him, you failed the bar exam twice. Are you lazy or just stupid? Are you stupid or just lazy? So for the next year and a half, every time he annoyed me, I'd say, are you stupid or just lazy? Are you stupid or just lazy? Gary never lived that one down. I was going to say one thing about uh, Jordan Magazine and talking about his father, which I hadn't realized, is when you look at the interviews that John did at George, many of them are connected to his father, which I don't think, I never understood that when I was reading it month to month, but he goes to interview Fidel Castro, that interview doesn't happen, but it's a very interesting story about what happens when they meet, he interviews George Wallace, uh, the man who stood up to his father, uh, the schoolhouse door, and the man who had also um, survived an assassination attempt. He interviews Gerald Ford, the last um, living member of the Warren Commission. They have a very interesting exchange. Um, uh, and so there were all these interesting sort of breadcrumbs that I don't think I would have noticed it at the time, but when you look uh, back at it now, 25 years later, almost every person that he had interest in interviewing uh, was connected to his death. In fact, he would sign notes, and his closest friends sometimes refer to him as JK. Yes. It was never JFK. JFK. No, it was JK. Cheers, JK. Yes. And everyone called him John. And he would walk into a room and go, Hi, I'm John. And we're like, you, we know. We know. We're good. We know. Um, but it was, I mean, I, I think the whole, I mean, just being back here for the convention, I mean, it's obviously a very different time and a very different, you know, situation but I think the most important thing that we got from George was that if people don't celebrate politics whatever your politics are in a way that engages you and makes you interested in it we never get past the division and I think that was his thing too was you know because he had Newt Gingrich on the cover and then Bill Clinton was interviewed for the magazine so it was it truly was not partisan, and people made fun of it and said it was fluffy and light and all of that. But who puts Nick Newkirk on the cover of George Magazine with a real lion? And he walks into the studio and he goes, Am I going to get eaten alive here? And our creative director, Matt, goes, Oh, I think we better. I don't know. But it was, it was basically trying to take the concept of politics and the concept of engagement and, and being involved in some way, you know, to a point where people could, it wasn't spinach, like they could right. digest it and understand it and really want to talk about it, and that was the goal, and getting young people involved. And no one was better to deflect the attack that, oh, you're being fraught, which is what the priesthood was saying, because I think John had a very acute sense of the downside and the darkness and the risks of politics. Right? And yet, instead of 
dwelling in that in, in that pain. He wanted to celebrate, and he he loved when you know there's this whole movement now. On, it's more on the right, but someone on the left that kind of show up and dribble. Right? Yeah. I don't want to hear from LeBron James. I don't want to hear from Barbara Streisand. About it. And some say that about you know I was I was on the earth this morning mocking Kid Rock because he's a piece of <laughs> talent. <laughs> um, but. The truth is, he would love both Kid Rock performing as much as Absolutely. speaking out or Steve Kerr. Yeah. You know, because anybody, more importantly, people who weren't in it, he's like, this is their country, this is their, I, I want to hear. So he published early uh, pieces, great pieces, they stand up, I look, I look at them, by Bill Maher, John Stewart, people who wound up becoming political comedians, but back then were kind of at the beginning of their careers. And John spotted them and saw that they could sneak the goods through customs with humor. Exactly. He, he did have an eye for that. He definitely did. And that was him. I and mean, that was what he, you know, kind of put himself out there. It's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, even with this nonprofit stuff, I'm gonna be John F. Kennedy Jr., but if it makes you donate and help kids come out of poverty, Fine, great. I'm good looking, I'm the sexiest man alive, I'm whatever you want me to be. <laughs> Open your wallet and help these kids, you know. What's the end goal, right? Well, yeah, the, the, I guess because I'm a political person, the, when I still get, what are you running? Run? Rose, what are you running? I know he was talking about running for governor, um, and I think that he probably would have run for governor of New York. He would have won, um, and then he would have gone on to the next thing. I'm not 100% he would have had the stomach to run for president, but I think he would have been a great governor of New York, and there would have been a lot of, you know, a lot of people in the Democratic Party hoping, I think they were already, hoping that he was someday going to step into the fray. I, I think you're ready to run. He did talk about it with some frequency. Not like, it wasn't like a master plan. It was like, um, and Teddy, I think it was, maybe Bill Bradley was retiring, or somebody was retiring from New Jersey. Morning, yeah. Oh no, no, oh, somebody, somebody from New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah. Teddy had this Pacacta scheme where John was going to run for the United States Senate from New Jersey. That was the line, remember, in the speech at the George Press Conference. <laughs> Where you said to him, "I'm going to get you, you. You wrote it for him. I'm going to get all the questions out of the way." Um, you know, uh, I've worn both boxes and braids. Yes, no, I've worn both. We're just friends. We're just friends. I swear she's my cousin from Rhode Island. Maybe someday, but not in New Jersey. Right. The answers to the most frequently asked personal questions are as follows. Yes, no, we're merely good friends, none of your business. Honest, she's my cousin from Rhode Island. I've worn both, maybe someday, but not in New Jersey. And that was the sort of, here are the answers to all the questions. And then he gets a question from a legit New York Times reporter. I don't remember who it was. And he says, and then he goes, excuse me? And she goes, can I get your phone number? And he goes, no. <laughs> Where do you think he would have taken George in this media age? He was already talking about a whole digital, you know, before there was even that going on. He was already talking about taking it online and having it be, and he's actually going to kind of change it up a little bit and make it like an entertainment news politics already. I mean, that was sort of in the works. And, and when he was flying up to Hyannis that night, he was stopping, he was meeting with a friend of his who was actually working for Paul Allen at Microsoft at the time, and they were going to talk about how do we put this online, how do we get this, you know, digital. So, yeah, it was on its way, but, you know, there are plenty of others that we have now that, uh, that have taken up the mantle, so thank goodness for that. Well. I want to get final thoughts and then make sure everybody gets a copy because it's really a hell of a read. It's a terrific piece of work with uh, Liz. Final thoughts on your subject. And, and by the way, the New York Times bestseller. It's, it's a runaway hit, so you're lucky to even get a copy. <laughs> uh, you know, I still have more questions about John. I mean, it was, it was a, such a fascinating 
character, and there was so much that we didn't know. I mean, that's what was so, we sort of knew John from the outside, incredibly handsome, charismatic man, but I really knew nothing about who he really was, and the connection to his father was sort of the, I think, the heart of the book. Um, you know, I think one of my favorite interviews was with a man named Narendra Tanasia, who he lived with in India for three weeks. They had a very interesting uh, connection, but the way he put it was that imagine that every day of your life, somebody comes up to you and tells you a story about your father or your mother, specifically your father, about how they, how he influenced you, how he um, inspired you, and you're reminded every day about what you don't have. And he said, imagine that. So every once in a while, there'd be sort of a light bulb moment for us, and when he said that, um, we sort of took that to heart when writing the book about what is that really like to be reminded of that every single day of your life? So, um, anyway, uh, hope you like the book and it has, it has a lot of heart, I think. I'll give it to Rose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that one of the most interesting things, and I talked about this earlier, about you know he had all he had this very close knit group of friends that he kept throughout his life. One of them, Gustavo, was here, and they were friends from his childhood in the White House and all throughout his life. And I think that the assumption is, is that John had this you know, presence, so he influenced them in, in so many ways, but I think each and every one of them influenced him in so many ways. And they were really instrumental, these people that he surrounded himself with in creating the man he became. So I think that was, that was really the most beautiful thing about the book. At his funeral, Teddy said he had every gift but time. Every gift but length of years. And you have, you kept them alive in this book. Thank you. And I really want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I, I really want to thank One Country Project for doing this for us and celebrating this book. And Tessa has been, Tessa Gould has been so amazing and supportive. And I obviously want to thank my fan, Heidi Heitkamp, who I miss so much. And Heidi Heitkamp. You know, it's always so amazing because most of us didn't have the kind of um, relationship or long-standing, um, uh, uh, you know, past with somebody that we just see as so iconic. That seems almost unreal. Seems like almost a superhero. And to hear these amazing stories, I couldn't help but think how proud he would be of how you have presented him as a wonderful, warm, unassuming, amazing young man who was taken way too soon from us and who would have known what he would have done for this country, what he would have done for people that uh, were less fortunate than he was. And, and I think everybody should get a copy of this book. You can get your picture taken back there with a copy of this book, but read it and think about not the loss, but think about celebrating an amazing life of someone that was taken too soon. Thank you, One Cup 100 Project was proud to support this. Um, and Tessa is like a horse. Uh, Make sure that this happens, so let's get a shout out there. And so um, grab a copy of the book, say hello, get your picture taken, and um, again, celebrate an amazing life. As I mentioned earlier, I had a wonderful time at this event, especially getting to meet Rosemary Terenzio and Liz McNeil, authors of JFK Jr. And everyone needs to go get a copy of this book. It just recently came out in July, August of this year. And it's awesome. It's a collection of different people that JFK Jr. knew throughout his life and just different stories um, broken up in little paragraphs. So it's always very interesting to hear from people's perspectives of who John was and what he stood for. That does it for this episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Of this extraordinary magazine, George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we, uh, we decided, I mean, 
actually taking a cue from, from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election that, that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms, uh, and there was a, a kind of a leveling process and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that, we felt that political magazines per se hadn't. Your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday. That's what I hear. Would she have liked George? I think she would have.